All right, good evening. We are going to uh, have class, even though half of my class has moved away uh, per the Army, or the Air Force, actually, and the other half is home, sick, possible strep throat, had to be in the ER this morning. But I'm going to go ahead and record uh, the conclusion to Old Testament survey tonight. Uh, we will pick up with the doctrines uh, when we're back together as a class. So we recently finished Jonah. So tonight we're going to start with uh, Micah. And the good Lord willing, I will finish Micah tonight. I mean, excuse me, finish with Malachi tonight. We'll try to go through this as best we can in a reasonable time and just see what we can learn here, okay? Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for anybody who might listen to this recording. Lord, I pray uh, giving you the glory for the ability to teach and for uh, the lessons that you've allowed me to learn, Lord. I know that some people look at the Bible and think, oh, we ought to just open it up and read it. Uh, but I'm thankful that... Uh, uh, you allowed me to be influenced by men who taught me it, we do need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, to rightly divide the word of truth, Lord. And as we try to uh, pass this along, as you, you're, uh, you had Paul write there in, in 2 Timothy to uh, teach other men who are able to teach others also lord i just pray that this would uh, bear fruit that perhaps we would know the 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 depth or the width of the harvest until we are at the judgment seat of christ lord but we put this whole situation in your hands and ask you to do what's best lord we love you we pray these things in christ's name that name above every name that name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess jesus christ is lord Amen. Okay, so Micah is a contemporary with Isaiah. And when we say here that it is the book of the great question, um, that question is found in the last chapter of the book. Um, in chapter 7 and verse 18, uh, Micah wrote, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth uh, by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Now that's written to the Jews, but I'm very thankful for it in my own life because I know I am certainly uh, not perfect. I have made mistakes in pastoring. I've made mistakes as a husband. I've made mistakes as a father. And I've made mistakes probably as a friend. I am thankful that we serve a God when we ask his forgiveness, he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. The key, uh, so it's the book of the great question based on 718. And the key verse is 6, 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before no, with thy God. And there is something in the New Testament that I wanted to take a look at uh, really quickly. I wrote something down, but I'm thinking I need to rethink that. So give me just a millisecond. In uh, 1 Peter, it talks about he that will uh, love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips 
uh, that they speak no guile, and let them eschew evil and do good, and let them seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's not exactly, but it's a similar teaching. Um, you might remember a, a contemporary Christian song from a few years ago about doing justice and loving mercy and so forth. Uh, again, this book is uh, contemporary with Isaiah. Uh, he uh, spans about 40 years here. Uh, the main characters are just men in general, but Micah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uh, and then you also have Judah and Israel, or their capitals, Jerusalem and Samaria. Sometimes the Old Testament writers would use the capital in a synonymous faction with the country there. The special features are the sins are condemned, idolatry, evil plans, covetousness, rapacity, uh, witchcraft, corruption, and treachery, but hope is coming. There's a righteous kingdom. There's a coming king and a complete triumph of divine grace, okay? The pictures and prophecies of Christ here. Uh, the, let's look at the occasion. The occasion sounds a lot like Jeremiah, right? But it's actually a, uh, again, he's a contemporary with Isaiah, which is a, a roughly 100 years before uh, Jeremiah. But uh, the occasion is the princes were cruel and greedy and the prophets were preaching falsely and the people were bound by them. And so God sent Micah and Isaiah to preach to them. But I want you to see that that God was, you know, people say, oh, well, that old Old Testament God and the New Testament God need to get on the same page because he was he was so mean in the Old Testament. Yeah, well, here's at least a hundred years he was preaching to his people to get right. Uh, here, uh, Micah, again, contemporary with Isaiah, but the Bible says of uh, Jeremiah's day in chapter 5, it's the last verse, of chapter 5 verse 31 the prophets prophesy falsely the priests bear rule by their means and my people love to have it so so god even in the old testament is a god of mercy the pictures and prophecy of christ we see in chapter 5 in verse 1 uh, <clears throat> that he is the judge of israel now gather thyself uh, in troops, O daughter of troops, he hath laid siege against thee, and they shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. All right, that is a um, prophecy of Christ's crucifixion. The very next uh, verse, uh, this is what the uh, scribes found for Herod when the wise men went to Herod looking for the king. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, um, as I guess it's Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old. See, it's not that Christ began there in Bethlehem. His goings have been from old um, and from everlasting. He's co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent with God. We also see the God of my salvation uh, in chapter 7 and verse 7. Therefore, I look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me and the light in 7, 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall. I shall arise when I sit in the darkness. The Lord shall be a light unto me. In chapters 1 to 3, remember this is a survey. I can't cover every detail in a survey. But in chapters 1 to 3, uh, we see the coming judgments. Uh, 4 to 5 is the deliverance. 6 and 7 are the exhortations and confessions of national sins along with the pro promises of restoration. That's I think that's one thing that's preventing us from seeing a national revival. Uh, I know lots of preachers who are very apt to point out the sins of the nation, but when I look at the Old Testament prophets who saw revival in their day, they confessed the sins of the nation as their own sin. Even though they weren't involved in it, they said, we have sinned against thee, O God, right? Very important. If we're going to see revival, remember, humble, pray, seek, and turn. That's God's people. Everybody wants revival to start with the lost people out there. No, revival starts with God's people. 
humbling ourselves and and we're so arrogant that we're not involved in the trans and we're not involved in the homosexuality and we're not involved in the promiscuity and we're not involved in the in the fentanyl and the other drugs out there we're not involved in the alcohol i uh, sometimes i think it would do some of us good to go out and get in a little sin now i say that tongue in cheek i don't think we need to but sometimes it seems like you know maybe that would that would humble us a little bit. We're, we're so proud of what we don't do, we forget all the stuff we're failing to do. Amen? It's very important. Humble. Pray. Seek the Savior. Turn from our wicked ways. That's repentance, all right? So then, let's go to Nahum, okay? Nahum. Nahum is the book of Nineveh's doom, okay? So this is about a hundred years after Isaiah, after Micah. This is a contemporary with Jeremiah. Nahum's name means full of comfort. It means compassion. So uh, God sent Jonah to preach to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want Nineveh to get right with God. He knew God is a God of mercy. And so he didn't want to go. He went the opposite direction. And, he, and he, he went to Joppa. And he took the ship. Because he didn't want God to have mercy on them. God had the whale swallow him up. Spit him out on dry land. He went and preached. He was still kind of mad at God. That the people repented. But he said repent or else. And, and, and they chose to repent. Amen. But here we are a hundred years later. And we're in the same problem with Nineveh, okay? So, let's look here at key verses here are in chapter 1, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Verses 7 and 8. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. If when we follow after God, he is our stronghold. And then some of us right now, we have all this anxiety because, uh, well, there's this split in the nation. Well, first off, we're supposed to be uh, dwelling on the good things and not on the evil things. But I want to remind you of Gideon. The enemies facing Gideon were without number. And God chose to use <coughs> 300. He had 32,000 people out there. He said, if you're scared, go home. 22,000 went home. He said, basically take them down to the creek. And the ones that have no fear, put them over here. And the ones that are courageous, that means they had fear, but they said their prayers, amen. Uh, put them over here, and it was 300 that were a little fearful, but were trusting God. It was 9,700 that were too stupid to be afraid, and God sent them home, and he chose to use 300 people. Don't worry about the numbers of people who stand against God. Just make sure you're standing with God, amen. The main characters here are Nineveh. This is a, wall, a walled city. It's 60 miles around. They could race chariots there, three at best. The towers of it were about 200 feet. And then there's Nahum. Nahum barely mentions his own nation because he's preaching about God's reserved judgment, not Judah's revenge. Remember, the New Testament is right there before your face. Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. All right? We see here the pictures of Christ. He's a stronghold. Uh, Nahum 1.15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. And that's compared to uh, Luke 4.18, where the Lord said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are blue, uh, that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable day of the Lord. 
I think it is just as maybe even a little more similar to Romans chapter 10 verse 16 as it is written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things amen so we see the Lord's patience his power his presence his purpose and protection in chapter 1 we see the siege of Nineveh in verses 1 to 8 of chapter 2, the sacking of Nineveh, in other words, its destruction. And then we see Nineveh's doom, what Nineveh's doom was deserved in chapter 3. They were fierce, they were filthy, they were fury, and they were fearful of, I mean, you know, they caused fear in others, and so they fell. All right? God says he's going to judge wickedness, and when God says it, it's true. Now, Habakkuk is a book of faith. Doubt and discouragement are tools of the devil. Having a doubt or being discouraged is not necessarily sin. But, brother, when we choose to dwell in discouragement, we are sinning against God. We are failing to trust God, all right? Um, this is the opposite of meditation. Meditation is thinking on the things of God and seeing how many different ways he could be glorified through a situation that we're in. Worry is thinking on the situation that we're in and seeing how many ways it could go bad. Worry takes the joy out of tomorrow before it ever gets here. 1 John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born, born of God, overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's why we sing the song, Faith is the Victory, all right? Excuse me. Faith is the victory. You've got to just trust God anyway. Hmm. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us to cast our cares upon him. Amen. Now, Habakkuk is kind of the Job or the Thomas of the prophets, okay? He's the last of the minor prophets. Time-wise, he prophesied to the southern kingdom. The key verse is uh, the key verse is chapter 2 and verse 4, which is quoted in Romans 1:17 and Galatians 3:11 and in Hebrews 10:38. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. But it's another thing we often talk of, especially those of us who are in ministry, we talk about, oh, I got a burden. I got a burden. Well, we shouldn't really have a burden. and We should be concerned for people, it's true. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I appreciate the way the Holy Spirit had uh, Habakkuk word this book. Chapter 1, verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. It is the lost people around us who are truly under a burden. It is the saved people who are lagging away from God and carrying things that they uh, should be giving to God that are under a burden. You can be uh, saved, uh, baptized, uh, a regular church attender, a tither, and sit in church three times a week and be carrying a burden that God didn't intend for you to carry because you refuse to cast it on God. You refuse to dwell on the good things. You refuse to worry about nothing and pray about everything. Instead, you worry about everything and pray about next to nothing, right? It's the book of faith here. Give it to God. The main characters are Habakkuk, God, the Chaldeans, and Judah. 622, 605, he prophesied just before the attack by Babylon. He's Job because it tells why he's suffering. He's Thomas because it tells why people doubt, okay? The occasion is, will God right the wrong? And faith must govern every area of our life. What do you do with doubt? 
I've got two young men I love like my own sons who are struggling right now with doubt. What do you do with doubt? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. Hmm? Give it to Jesus. Tell him about it and give him time to work it out and rejoice in his answer. The pictures and prophecies of Christ were well, justified by faith. The Lord is the Holy One and he's the God of my salvation. Okay? You see him... Uh, the God of my salvation in uh, 718. Uh, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. Okay, that's the very last uh, verse there. Uh, <clears throat> here's a, a very important prayer. Okay, we talked about he's the Holy One. He's the God of my salvation. The Holy One is in chapter 3, verse 3. God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. But I want you to listen to his prayer in Habakkuk 3, 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. I think this is a, uh, Scott Pauley is the one who pointed this out to me probably 25 years ago. But I think it is very applicable to our own country at this moment in the midst of the years make known in wrath, remember mercy. We need a revival, which is what Habakkuk's praying for. We deserve the wrath of God, but he's praying for God to remember mercy. Amen. People are asking why. Even the prophet is asking why. He's troubled over the sins of Judah. He's troubled over the Chaldean invasion. He's troubled over the character of the Chaldean. The waiting prophet receives an answer. God gives him a word of comfort. God speaks woes upon the wicked. The praying prophet asks for revival and mercy. God's glory is praised. His power is exhibited. And his purpose is seen. Habakkuk did the right thing with his doubts and his discouragements, he took them to God, okay? That's what we got to do with them. Take it to God. If we take it anyplace else, it's sin. So Zephaniah is the book of the remnant. The key verse is Zephaniah 1, 12. It shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Now, settled on their lees. What does this mean? Hmm. Well, you can uh, use it in a in a naval sense when you are on the lee side of an island the hurricane's coming against the island and you're on the opposite end from whence it comes then you're on the lee side of the of the storm of the island in the storm but i don't think that's what he's talking about when you put up juice in the old-fashioned way where you just crush the fruit and you capture the juice uh, then pulp would settle in the bottom of whatever container you had it in. And that pulp would, would I don't want to be too gross, but it basically kind of rot down there. So there was basically two ways to keep that juice from going bad. Number one, you had to continually shake it up. Go in every day and shake it up and keep the pulp suspended in the juice. Number two, you could pour the juice let the leaves, let the, 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 the pulp settle to the bottom, settled on their leaves, and then pour off and try to leave as much of the pulp there in the bottom of the container that you have the juice in. And that's basically what God says is, hey, 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 you're not living right. I'm about to shake you up. When we look at the Old Testament, we see time and again when Solomon was right with God. God said, hey, if I shut up the heavens, hey, if I send the locusts, hey, 
If I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Most every book in the Old Testament, at least all the books of that we call the prophets, the major and the minor, they are trying, they are recording of God shaking up his people. Verse 14 tells us that judgment's coming. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. 15 to 18, neither money nor strength can help the people evade the judgment of God. I mean, sadly, that's what a lot of Americans think. Uh, if you look in your Bibles in, in verse 14, howl ye inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. That was basically the Wall Street of God's people. They had become greedy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just one class of people. All of them were involved in this greed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The main character is Zephaniah, the discerning prophet, Judah or Jerusalem, the defiled people, and the desolate places of the um, Gentile nations. This is, again, a contemporary of Jeremiah. He prophesied in Judah. He's the hellfire and brimstone preacher of the Old Testament. Judah is never mentioned because one cannot truly legislate morality. I'm a little conflicted with that statement. I think we have to legislate morality, but it's like our founding fathers said about our Constitution. Our Constitution was written by and for a Christian people, and apart from Christianity, that document's next to useless. The occasion. Judgment brings bitterness, but it can bring, bring blessing. The difference is, what is our response to the judgment? Are we repentant or are we rebellious? Rebellious, bitterness. Repentant, blessing. Jeremiah preaches, excuse me, Zephaniah preaches in three directions. At home, chapter 1, chapter 2 through chapter 3, he preaches around. And then the end of chapter 3, he preaches ahead or about the future. The Lord is in the midst of them in chapter 3, verse 15. The Lord is merciful in chapter 3. Excuse me, midst 3 5, merciful 3 15, and the Lord is mighty in 3 17. Again, this is a book of judgment. Okay. Let's look at Haggai. Haggai is the book of building. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are post-exilic books. In other words, these fit right beside Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Remember, es Esther was married to King Ahasuerus, so she stayed back in the land of captivity. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra came to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah came to rebuild the wall. Key verse 1-8. Go up to the mountain. Bring wood and build the house. I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He's talking about the temple, right? Uh, this is a festive celebration. Uh, Haggai came back with Zerubbabel. So he actually predates Ezra and Nehemiah being in there. Uh, each sermon is dated chapter 1, 1, chapter 2, 10, chapter 2, 20. These are different times in the second year of... Um, Darius, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, chapter 2, 10, chapter 2, and verse number 10, in the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of King Darius, in 2.20, again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the fourth and twentieth day of the month. So you got a date here. The main characters, Darius the king, Zerubbabel, the governor, 
Joshua the high priest, Haggai the prophet. 2 Corinthians 3, 14. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in Christ. Four great lessons here. The danger of waiting rather than working. Everybody treats our Christian life like we treat diets. We're going to start Monday. You start today or you'll never start. It's what it amounts to. The danger of lamenting the past and, and missing the present. Man, I think all of us, again, we're guilty of that. Uh, right now, I mean, I used to laugh at my dad's generation longing for the 50s and their early adulthood days. But, you know, here is my generation uh, longing for the 80s. We feel like the music was better. The culture was better. There was less racial divide. There was less divide between the Democrats and Republicans, for goodness sake. Uh, Tip O'Neill was a Democrat, and he and uh, Reagan got along well. Nothing like we see with with Trump versus Pelosi and and uh, Schumer and all of these different guys. I mean, but if we spend all of our time lamenting that it's not the 1980s anymore, we miss what God can do in us and through us in the present. The danger of looking at the material rather than the, the, the spiritual and the danger of recognizing the enemies but forgetting who is with us. Right now, I think there's a lot of anxiety, especially on the part of of uh, the younger millennials and the older uh, Gen, Gen Zs is filled with anxiety about uh, the situation that we're in. Uh, honestly, it's because we continue to forget who is on our side, the Lord, okay? This the occasion of the building of the house of God. The priority of the work of God is in verse 2 of chapter 1. Thus speaketh the Lord of the host, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Hmm. The principles, verses 6 to 11, got to take care of God's work first, and then he'll take care of us. Just like the old widow woman took care of Elijah, and then God took care of the widow woman, right? The purpose, verse 8, God's glory and pleasure. I will take pleasure. I will be glorified. The pictures and prophecies of Christ, 2, 7, 9, and 23. Okay, 2, 7, 9, and 23. 2-7, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And verse 23, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee saith the Lord of hosts. Okay? You've got a call to build. Consider your ways. A message to the prince and priests, a message to the people, and a message of encouragement to everybody, a call to courage, basically be strong. Don't worry about the circumstances. God's going to take care of us. He's going to comfort us. A call to consider. you got some riddles in chapter 2, 10 to 13, the application and a call to endure. I have chosen thee. Now we look at Zechariah. Zechariah is a book of jealousy. Okay. If you look in chapter 8, this is the longest. Um, Zechariah means the one that Jehovah remembers. Berechiah, Jehovah blesses. Edo, the appointed time, the one Jehovah remembers to bless at the appointed time. Listen to this. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. The one Jehovah remembers to bless at the appointed time. Huh? Let's get to this jealousy thing. Chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. And I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy 
mountain. Uh, 560 to 520, again, this is during the work on the temple. Uh, the last few chapters are after the temple is completed. Zechariah the prophet, uh, the unfinished temple, and the discouraged remnant, and the Lord of hosts are the main characters. This is the longest of the Old Testament, uh, uh, my, excuse me, of the minor prophets, and this is like the, the revealing, the apocalypse of the Old Testament. Okay, the occasion is basically, here's how to stay strong. The secret of power is in the Holy Spirit. You've got eight visions recorded here in Zechariah. So you've got a call to repentance in the first part of the book. You've got eight visions, the horse among the myrtles, four horns and four craftsmen, a man and a measuring line, the cleansing of Joshua, the golden lampstand, the flying scroll, the woman in a basket, and four chariots. You've got four messages, rebuke of hypocrisy, repent of disobedience, the restoration of Israel, and rejoice in Israel's future. The burden of Zechariah is the rejection of of the Messiah when we should be looking toward the reign of the Messiah. But look at all of these pictures and prophecies of Christ here. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Branch is in all capital letters. It is talking about Jesus Christ. 612. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Uh, verse 13. You see, he's priest and king. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, shall sit and rule upon his throne, and shall be the priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So he's going to be a Jesus, is our priest and our king. Uh, he's uh, just and lowly. Chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation. Lowly, riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Can you not see the prophecy of Jesus Christ there? Uh, chapter 10, 4. Out of him uh, forth came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. Uh, chapter 12 and verse 10. We see that he is the spirit of grace. I took my staff even beauty, that's capitalized, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which that's the wrong chapter, John. Uh, 12.10, here we go. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the habits of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. You see the picture of Christ there? He's the fountain of living water. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. He is the shepherd. Chapter 13 and verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Again, I can see the crucifixion in this. Uh, chapter 14 and verse number 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. The millennial reign. Chapter 14, 16, the millennial reign. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of tabernacles. Okay? Zechariah. Now, Malachi is the very last book of the Old Testament. I don't think it's time-wise. It's absolutely the last one written, but it's, it's pretty close. These three are pretty close together. Malachi is Jehovah's messenger. 
Malachi was a contemporary with Nehemiah. Uh, this We call it the book of robbery. I'm sure you know why. We'll read those verses the, uh, in a second. Malachi 3, 8, we see the, the accusation, the interrogation, and the refutation. Malachi 3, 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Verse 10, I think is just as important. Verse 9, you're cursed with a curse because you've robbed me, basically, for ye have robbed me. Verse 9, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The, um, uh, the temple is built. Uh, Malachi and is actually preaching from within the temple, okay? This is the, Nehemiah is the last book of history. Malachi is the last prophetic book. The main characters are the preacher himself, complacent Judah. Oh my goodness, does that not sound like American Christians, right? We are biblically illiterate. We are spiritually impotent, and we are complacent and apathetic about it. And the laws of God. The occasion is to expose the sins of the Pharisees. Formalism. Do this, do this, do that, do the other. And the Sadducees, skepticism. The Sadducees didn't believe anything that they couldn't explain um, with human logic. And encourage the remnant. The special, fe special features, Malachi represents God as having a dialogue with the people. God asks sarcastic questions, and they say, ye say, is found 11 times. Malachi says, thus saith the Lord, 25 times. Out of 55 verses, 47 of them, God is speaking to the people. 4.4 four concludes the Old Testament. 5 and 6 connect the New Testament. Let me read them to you. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. That's the end of the Old Testament. Connection to the New Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and, to the, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I'm going to give you the outline, then I'm going to give you something that I think is very encouraging. It's not original with me, but it is powerful. Malachi is a message for a dark day, all right? It's a privileged nation, and yet it's a polluted nation. Sins of the priests, sins of the people. I think this is true for America, sins of the priests, sins of the people, sins of the politicians. Now, there are no biblical promises to America other than the general uh, promises to the righteous. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So I still believe we could see a national revival and see our country turn back to Christ. The question is, will we, God's people, have the good sense to humble, pray, seek, and turn so that he will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land? The promise, rewards of the book of remembrance, rewards of the coming Christ, and the prophecy of the coming Elijah, which we all know is... John the Baptist. So the pictures and prophecies of Christ, 3.11. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, saith the Lord of hosts. That is, that is 3.11, but that is, does not have the words messenger of the covenant. I will post exactly where that is. Let me give me just a second.
It's not 311, it is 31. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So the two messengers, let's take away one of those. Are John the Baptist and the messenger of the covenant, okay? The one who made us is coming, Jesus, the refiner, purifier. 4-2, he is the son of righteousness, okay? In one of these books we looked over, no, it's right here, the message for a dark day. Let's talk about that. So, uh, this is a message for a dark day. Jesus is... Look, the, 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 the proprietors, the business people were inconsistent. The priests were insincere. The politicians, much like our own, were insane. But Malachi came to tell us about the Lord. And we see first he is the caring one. We're talking about a message for a dark day. Malachi 1, 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. He's the caring one. He is the crowned one. Chapter 1, verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth, and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For, or because, I am a great king saith the Lord of hosts. My name is dreadful among the heathen. Christ was crowned in mockery there on the cross, but he will be crowned in majesty and he will be crowned mightily. All right? Now, O you priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart, give glory to my name, crowned in majesty. I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings I have cursed him already because he did not lay it to heart. He's the crowned one. He's the cleansing one. Chapter 3 and verse 3, He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. God's judgment in this life is to bring about righteousness in the life of his own children. And finally, he is the chain. It's not finally, but he is the changeless one. Chapter 3 and verse 6, I am uh, the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And finally, he is the curing one. Chapter 4 and verse number 2, uh, he is the... Um, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And he is the claiming one. Chapter uh, 3 and verse 17. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So, let me just repeat those things to you. The message for the dark day. Remember now, this is these are the last words spoken to the children of Israel for 400 years. He's the caring one. He is the crowned one, the cleansing one, the changeless one, the claiming one, and the curing one. Amen. Ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. In other words, we'll be fat and happy. All right, that is the close of the survey of the Old Testament. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you again for anybody who has listened or will listen to this recording, and I pray that they would grow in their faith because of it. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it. Amen.